um, my colleagues and collaborators that I'll mention in the rest of this presentation, you'll see their names coming back. Um, they've been uh, major collaborators on, on several of the studies that I'll, um, I'll cite um, in, the, in, the, in the coming presentation. Um, so today, the, the main question that I would like to ask is a question that actually I've been interested in in the last decade. Um, and that question is, have we missed anything in ecology by focusing on certain interaction types while ignoring others? Um, as you may know, um, a lot of ecological theory has been based on predation and competition. And of course, other interaction types have attracted attention as well, such as um, plant pollinator interactions, for example. But if we look at the literature, um, these are only a subset of the diversity of ways um, species influence and depend on each other in nature. So can we improve our understanding and predictive ability of natural communities by incorporating the diversity of interaction types which we know coexist in nature in ecological theory? This is the, the main question that I'd like to ask today and discuss with you. Um, ecological communities are, of course, very complex networks of interdependencies. Um, here you see um, an example of a network from the Chilean web, um, where the, the colorful disks are species and um, the white links are feeding interactions among the species. And because of this complex networks of links, um, it's, of course, very difficult to predict how a perturbation will propagate in such a network and eventually affect the entire community. And this question is, of course, becoming an increasing concern in the current context of global change and in particular of uh, species extinctions. The question of species extinction has been of interest for a very long time in ecology, both um, theoretically and empirically. And here uh, I'd like to start this presentation with an example of a clear discrepancy between current ecological theory and experimental work. Um, actually, this is work from my colleague um, Ian Donohue, who's a professor at Tr Trinity College in Dublin, Ireland. Um, and so Ian and his team um, and collaborators, they've performed field experiments on the rocky shore of the east coast of Ireland. And they're interested in, in investigating the consequence of species loss occurring at different trophic levels. So this is um, a very simplified uh, trophic network of, uh, of these communities. Um, you have predators, crabs and whelks which consume uh, two groups of primary consumers, grazers and mussels. Um, and you have macroalgae that are consumed by the grazers. So this is a very uh, simplified food webs. And what they did uh, was to uh, simulate the local extinction of either one of the top consumer species in isolation or in combination with the removal of the primary uh, consumers, so the grazers or the mussels. And then um, they followed the experiments for 14 months and they were interested in the effect of the simulated removals on um, the biomass of the overall community and possible secondary extinctions in particular among the macroalgae taxa. So at the beginning of the experiments, there were 16 macroalgae taxa in those communities. So here is what they found. Um, what you'll see in this graphic are the number of secondary extinctions. So how many of the 16 macroalgae taxa were extinct at the end of the 14 month? In um, the case where nothing was changed and the case where welts were removed or crabs were removed. And what they found was as follows. Um, on average, less than one species um, was extinct in the absence of any manipulation. But when either one of the top predator was removed, um, they were on average five times more secondary extinctions of the macroalgae taxa. And this happens when either one of the top predator is removed. Now, if in addition, 
um, the primary consumers are manipulated. What you'll see here is the case where either grazers or mussels are removed, but no uh, top predator. And here you see the cases where they're removed in combination with one of the top predator. In that situation, what they found was as following. Actually, in all these cases where um, one of the primary consumers was removed, they didn't find um, significant increase in secondary extinctions compared to the control um, treatment, the case where no species was removed. So the conclusion of that experiment was that um, a large number of secondary extinctions occurred when either one of the top predator was removed in isolation. And this did not happen when they were removed in combination with primary consumers. So in sum, a third of the macroalgae taxa were lost following um, the removal of either of the predator species. And what is interesting is that this is actually an order of magnitude greater than predicted by theoretical studies. So this suggests that um, the, the theoretical studies, the classical uh, resource consumer models actually suggest that secondary extinctions occur uh, more frequently when you remove basal or intermediate species, but they're um, less likely to occur when you remove top predators. So this observation is much larger than observed in theoretical studies, but it is actually in, in good agreement with other classical work in ecology. Um, the most famous one being probably the work of um, Robert Payne, uh, which he performed in, uh, in the 60s on the rocky intertidal of uh, Washington state. So Robert Payne was studying um, ecological communities, which um, uh, consist of about 15 species, uh, where here um, the feeding interactions are mapped and you see the starfish as being um, a top predator in those communities. And um, what he did was to remove the starfish and follow the consequences for the community uh, through time. And what he found was that starting from 15 species initially, the community decreased to seven species after one and a half year and to a single species, the mussels, after seven years. So in agreement with, uh, with um, the, the study from Ian Donohue, which I just mentioned, in this case, it's a classical example of um, an experiment where removing a single species, a top predator, destabilized an entire community and led to a large number of secondary extinction. So there is this puzzling discrepancy between these uh, observations um, where top predators can lead to a large number of secondary extinctions and the prediction of most theoretical models um, in which removal of top predators um, lead to much fewer secondary extinctions. So we may wonder what are the key missing ingredients in, in our models? Um, I've talked about these models in, in very generic terms so far, but these models um, are basically food web models. Um, they are models that describe feeding interactions between those species of a community. And actually, if you look um, at these intertidal communities in more detail, uh, here you see a picture of the intertidal zone of central Chile. This is a picture of my, my colleague, Ivi Vieters. Well, these communities, um, they may seem quite simple when you look at them um, from far away, but actually if you zoom in, um, you can see a lot of different um, big richness in species and also interaction types. Um, there's many feeding interactions that are well known and well described. Um, for example, here you see heliaster searching for food and you see chitons that are herbivores, but you see other type of interactions that are also very well studied. Um, for example, you can see here uh, competitions for space between um, algae. Here um, you see algae, gelidium, um, which facilitate the recruitment of muscle on the shore. And one interaction that I, I like very much is um, this interaction between mussels and crabs, where in these communities, the mussels, they form three-dimensional structures in uh, which crabs can hide 
And in those communities, actually, food is not really limiting for crabs. There's plenty of food, but they compete very fiercely for those hideouts where they are protected from the waves and also from their predators. So clearly, in those communities, all these interaction types, they coexist simultaneously. And so these communities are complex networks of dependencies where species depend on each other in many different ways. So going back to the, the rocky shore food web of the east coast of Ireland, um, in this system, other type of interactions are also well known. And for example, um, there is clear competition for space between uh, mussels and all the macroalgae taxa and also among the macroalgae taxa themselves. And there is um, an interaction um, that is called foraging modulation that occurs between the two uh, predators, the crabs and the whelks. And what happens is that um, basically, they, the two predators, they change their feeding preference depending on the presence of the other predator. So the, the, each of them, when alone, they tend to prefer grazers, but when they're together, they rebalance um, their feeding preference um, between grazers and mussels. So this means that um, mussels are proportionally more eaten when the two predators are present than when they're, uh, each of them is alone. So to try to explore this discrepancy between um, observations and, and model prediction, um, we used, we investigated the role of these non-feeding interactions in, the, in a dynamical model. Um, this was work of um, Alexandre Jena, who's a former PhD student in my group and is now doing a, a postdoc um, in Chile, Las Cruces, with uh, Sergio Navarrete and Yigi Peters. So what we did was um, to study, to use a classical bioenergetic consumer resource model where um, the biomass B of each species I uh, follows an ordinary differential equation, which is um, as, as follows. Um, you have a growth term, which differs depending on whether the species is a primary producer or not primary producer. Then all, any species can be eaten, and there is a loss term due to metabolism. Um, now, the functional response here is a multi-prey holding type functional response. And what we do is we use um, a lumetric relationship to define most of the parameters in that model. That means that um, if you know the average body mass of an individual of a group, uh, group of species or, or species, um, you can use general relationships to parameterize the model, most of the terms of the model, at least the feeding terms in the model. And also remember that we know we have the, the ecological network, so um, we have the structure of the food web and we map this dynamical equation to, um, to the food web observed in, in the field. Now in this model, what we wanna do is incorporate non-feeding interactions. So how do we do that? Um, the term non-trophic interactions, um, just the, the, the name of it uh, already reflects the, the problem. Non-trophic interactions are defined as everything that is non-trophic. Um, and uh, this is a little bit overwhelming. Like how do you, how can you create order in that diversity of ways species can influence each other? So a while ago, with some colleagues, we, we reviewed the literature to try to find a way of categorizing the non-trophic interactions into categories that could be useful, useful for modeling in particular. And so here is what we came up with. There are cases where one species influences an interaction between two other species. So here, the red species is modifying an interaction between two other species. Um, if you remember the example of the, um, the crab and the mussels, imagine that um, this is a crab, this is a predator of the crab, and the mussel here is decreasing the ability of the predators to find the crab. So in this case, such an interaction involves three nodes um, by definition. Now you have other cases where one species, 
modifies a node attribute. For example, a species can affect the mortality or survival of another species. It can modify um, its establishment um, success, um, its growth rate, its reproduction rate, and so forth. Um, finally, there is a third category of interaction that we identified, which is in the case where you can have um, flows of matter in and out of the system, um, a node, a species could modify those, um, those flows. Um, for example, you can imagine that um, if plants, so here you see a picture of a dry land, and plants um, improve the how much water is retained locally in the system. So plants would, in this case, decrease the loss of water out of the system. So with these three categories, the idea is that when you're interested in non-traffic inter interaction, you can identify the parameters of your dynamical model that are affected by that non-traffic interaction. So for example, in the last example I gave, this would be the immigration, immigration rate of species or the incoming or outgoing flow of resource. Once you have identified that uh, parameter, instead of remaining a constant, the idea is that that parameter now becomes a function of the species that are source of the interaction. Just to give you an example, uh, here is how a competition for space was included here. Um, so G here is the, the recruitment rate of the species in the system. And in this case, in the food web model, it's a constant, a characteristic of species I. But now we're saying many other species K are competing for space with species I, and therefore they're decreasing um, their recruitment uh, rate in the, in the system. And so G is going to now become a decreasing function of the abundance of all these K species that are competitors of I. And then uh, this is a very simple example where you would have a linear decreasing relationship um, between G and, and the abundance of the competitors. So this is just an example of, of how uh, we can incorporate um, non-feeding interaction in a general way in those food web models. So going back to our model, we start with a food web model, a classical consumer resource model, and we incorporate two types of non-traffic interactions in that model, competition for space and the foraging modulation between the two predators. And now I mentioned that um, we use allometric scaling to parameterize most of the parameters of the model, but we don't have any idea about the intensity of competition for space and for aging modulation. So for these parameters, we don't have an idea of a realistic range of value. So what Alexandre did is that he ran simulations for a broad range of values of the two non-trophic interactions. And you see here on the x-axis, the strengths of for aging modulation and on the y-axis, the competition strength. And um, what he does is he starts with all the species of the food web present, and then he performs the same experiments as those performed in the field. So removing either one of the top predator alone or a combination with the primary consumers. And then he records um, the number of secondary extinctions that may happen uh, among the macroalgae taxa. And so in green in this parameter uh, space will be the area where the outcome of the model simulations match those of the experiments performed in the field. And here are the results. Um, what you see is that the in green here, the simulation results only match um, the field experimental results when there is an intermediate intensity of uh, competition for space. Interestingly, in gray here, you see that there is no secondary extinction. And this corner here, is the case where you have a pure food web. So there is no competition for strength for space and no uh, foraging modulation. And what you see is that in a pure food web, um, the model is unable to reproduce um, the results of the experiment. Now there's something else that um, 
I mentioned um, Ian Donohue and colleagues um, measured in the experiments, it's the changes in biomass of all the species. Um, and what happens when either one of the top predator is removed is not only that you have secondary extinctions among the macroalgae taxa, but also that um, there is an increase of, uh, of uh, muscle biomass of 20 to 60 percent, and also the, um, the grazer biomass doesn't change much. So in the second graphic uh, here, Alexandre plotted um, the space of the of parameter combinations where the, the simulations match the results of the experiments in terms of changes in biomass. And that will be in yellow. And what he found was this, um, there is here um, a little space uh, where the simulation results match those of the field experiments and they correspond to case where you have intermediate competition for space as well as intermediate to high for aging modulation. So the conclusion of this um, exercise was that actually in this case, the diversity of interaction type was uh, needed for the model to be able to reproduce the results of the uh, experiments. And so in this case, incorporating the diversity of interaction types was one of the way of resolving this discrepancy between the observations, the field observations and the model predictions. But this is one specific study. And, um, and then we became more interested, interested more generally um, in terms of what's the role of that diversity of interaction types um, for species coexistence and community functioning. So building on this uh, study, we use the same uh, model um, modeling framework, but this time we incorporated in the model a broader range of non-feeding interactions. Um, and we incorporated non-trophic interactions that were found in that review paper, which I mentioned earlier, um, which were found to be commonly um, described in the ecological literature. So there is again competition for space, but there is also predator interference. The fact that when two predators share prey, they tend to fight for this prey, this common prey. Um, there is recruitment facilitation. So for example, uh, remember the example of gelidium facilitating the recruitment of mussels. Refuge provisioning. Um, so the exa an example would be the crabs um, hiding um, in the in the three-dimensional structure built by the muscles. And there is also a broad range of positive and negative effects on uh, survival of species. So in total, there are, there are uh, six non-trophic interactions that we incorporated in that model. And here is um, um, the simulation that we ran. We start with a, with a niche model to generate uh, food webs that had a realistic structure. And this initial food web, they, they composed of 100 species, including 20 plants. So the niche model is, is one way of building a, a food web that has a structure that, that makes sense. And in this food web skeleton, uh, we're going to plug non-trophic interaction links randomly because we don't really have an idea of realistic structures for these non-trophic interactions. And then we run dynamical simulations with and without these non-trophic interactions. So all simulations are run in pairs. Uh, you have um, the food web alone and the same food web with the same parameter values, but with the non-trophic interactions. Um, as I mentioned for the, the previous study, we have an issue, which is that we have an idea of how to generate realistic parameter values, at least realistic ranges of parameters for the feeding parameters, but we have no idea about um, values and, and relative values for the non-trophic interactions. So we try to come up with a way of trying to put non-trophic interactions on, um, on a kind of similar scale, just as a, base, as a baseline for our study. So what we did was the following. Again, we run simulation with and without NTI, non-trophic interactions. And at the end of the simulation, we measure how many species survive. We start with 100 species. And so one thing we measured was uh, what we called variation in species diversity, which is the um, uh, diversity, the species number at the end of the simulation with non-trophic interaction um, compared to the 
number of species at the end of the simulation in the food web, so without non-trophic interaction. So you have the relative change in species diversity due to a given non-trophic interaction. And then what we do is that we do that for every non-trophic interaction, and we do that for different values, different intensities of that non-trophic interaction. So for example, here in the case of predator interference, that's the parameter that, that measures or that um, yeah, measures how fiercely predators compete for common prey. We run simulation for different values of that parameter, and we um, calculated that uh, relative change in species diversity. And we, we found um, the range of parameter values here that lead to 2.5 to 10% of change in species diversity. And we do that for every um, non-trophic interaction, meaning that for every non-trophic interaction, we have a range of values which we know constrains the variation in diversity between 2.5 and 10%. And these values are, of course, very different among non-trophic interaction. And it's one way of making sure that despite the fact that we look at very different mechanisms and very different interaction types, they are all put on a similar scale, at least uh, from the point of view of their effect on species diversity. This doesn't mean that this is realized in nature, but for us, since we have no idea of um, realistic values for these parameters, it's one way of trying to putting all interaction types on equal footing in terms of species diversity. So, and then um, we make a choice, which is that we say, okay, we have those, um, the, this range of, this predefined range of values, and we're also going to put exactly the same number of positive and negative non-trophic interactions. Positive non-trophic interactions is non-trophic interactions that have a positive effect on species diversity, and conversely for negative non-trophic interactions. That's how we define them. So now if we put the same number of negative and positive non-trophic interactions, and we take a value um, randomly in a range which is defined so that they have a similar effect on species diversity, we expect that by running many, many simulation on average, these non-trophic interactions are not expected to have a strong effect on species diversity. That's the idea. And so at the end of the simulations, we uh, calculate species diversity, how many species survive, and the total biomass. And what we're interested in is um, how does biomass change as the number of species that survive at the end of the simulation changes? Here you'll see the, the, this graph for um, the case where you have no non-trophic interaction, so it's a food web alone. And what we find is a classical relationship that is well known in ecology, the biodiversity ecosystem functioning relationship. So a positive relationship between how many species survive and the total biomass um, at the end of the simulation. Now, if we, if we draw the same figure, but in the case where our diverse interaction types are um, included in the, in the system, what you see is that the slope is much stronger um, than you get than what you get with a food web alone. And this is very interesting. And this is actually not really expected because as I tried to explain, we made sure that the effect on diversity, on species diversity should be minimal. So the reason for this uh, change of slope is really the is really due to the um, relative effect that the non-trophic interactions have on biomass for a certain uh, diversity level. And actually this relationship can be explained in a very mechanistic way. What happens is that in the case here where you have species that are um, communities that are relatively rich in species, um, these communities by chance, because again, we take all the, the intensity of the non-trophic interaction randomly in a predefined range. So by chance, these communities tend to have strong positive non-trophic interactions. And in the presence of those strong positive non-trophic interactions, you have communities that are 
that have a relatively high uh, number of species, and this is associated to disproportionately high total biomass. Conversely, um, in, those, in those cases here, uh, where the species diversity is relatively low at the end of the simulations, these communities by chance had a few very negative um, non-trophic interactions such as competition for space. And so these communities where there is strong um, negative non-trophic interactions tend to have low species diversity associated with a lower, um, relatively lower um, biomass than you would expect in a food web alone. So we expect actually this difference in slope to be a gen very general phenomenon. When uh, you look at diverse communities, when diverse types of interactions are involved, that this diverse interaction will mechanistically increase the slope of this relationship. Um, because you may have communities with more positive interactions and communities with stronger negative interactions, and this will change the, they will, this will increase the slope of that relationship. Now, this relationship is often used to think of um, the effect of species extinction on community functioning. And so what this stronger slope means is that when we, if we lose species in those communities, the effect of functioning is um, stronger than what you would expect if you study, if you assume that only feeding interactions are present. So the, the conclusion of that second study is that non-trophic interaction actually strengthen the relationship between species diversity and community functioning and thereby affect one of the fundamental relationship um, um, of ecology. But um, so far, we've, we've included this non-trophic interaction, at least in this last study, we included its non-trophic interaction uh, completely randomly about the food web. And one of the questions that I think is a real challenge in the field right now and remains entirely open is how, what's the structure of these non-trophic interactions? And more specifically, how do they map onto each other? What's the relative structure of different interaction types to each other? Um, so what's the structure of a network that includes diverse interaction types simultaneously, what we call a multiplex network in network science. So a network where you have a set of nodes. So here's species that are connected by not only one type of interactions, but different types of interactions simultaneously. And so I won't go into the details, but just to mention that a few years ago with my colleagues Sergio Navarrete, Evie Vieters, and Eric Bello, we published a um, full ecological network for the, um, the coastal marine ecosystem of Chile, um, where we described 406 species of these intertidal communities, all known um, trophic here in yellow and non-trophic in blue and pink uh, interactions that are known uh, for this set of species. And well, this was very interesting because we realized that non-trophic interactions are not only much more abundant than what we expected, but also that they have a very clear structure. And using a modeling approach very very close, very similar to the one I presented um, in the two previous studies, we could show that actually this three-dimensional structure, um, so the, the way the trophic interactions and the positive and negative non-trophic interactions are mapped onto each other, um, in these communities, it's, it tends to increase uh, species persistence, total biomass, but also to decrease the number of secondary extinctions. Of course, this is only uh, one single data set, and we don't, we don't really know how, if that can be generalized to other intertidal areas or even other ecosystems. And so these are the type of questions that we'll only be able to address as more data sets are becoming available. So overall, um, these series of studies, which I mentioned today, um, showed that our theory based on trophic interactions, or at least one type of interactions, um, shows discrepancies with observations. And that 
at least in some cases, including the diversity of interaction types that are known to coexist in nature, uh, but has so far been neglected in the literature, could help bridging this gap between observations and uh, theory. We, I, we saw that um, the incorporation of non-trophic interaction can increase secondary extinctions um, following the extinction of a top predator. And so that also means that when we ignore non-trophic interactions, uh, we would greatly under, underestimate the number of secondary extinctions. Um, in the same way, non-trophic interactions strengthen the, the biodiversity ecosystem functioning relationship. And that means that by ignoring non-trophic interactions, we would greatly underestimate the effect of uh, species extinctions on um, ecosystem productivity. Um, so, so far, I think um, these studies on multi-interaction networks that are, study, that are starting to uh, emerge in the ecological literature, they've been um, contributing, they've been pieces of a puzzle that we, we start um, assembling that contributes to building a clearer picture of when and how this diversity of interaction types matters, because it doesn't mean that it's always relevant to include all type of non-trophic interactions, actually probably not, hopefully not. And so one of the very important question is when do we need to include what type of other interactions so that we have a clear idea of the, and especially predictive ability of the dynamics of ecological communities. And so these um, studies, they start um, building that this, picture, but we, we still at the beginning and we still lack um, a general idea uh, of um, why and how diff diverse type of, in of interactions matter for our fundamental understanding, but also predictive ability of natural communities in uh, the context of global change. And so I've been talking about multi-interaction networks because this is what I'm interested in, like how diverse interaction types can change our, our vision of, of the functioning and stability of ecological community. But actually, um, this is part more generally of, um, of a body of literature which has been called multi-layer ecological networks or multi-layer networks in network science. Um, because in ecological communities, we don't only have diverse interaction types, but it, these networks, they also change in time and in space. And, um, and so there's a broad range of studies that are started to emerge that, that try to incorporate tools from network science to better describe um, the temporal and spatial dynamic of, of ecological networks. And this, of course, open a whole range of new open questions. And with this, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy to answer questions.